someone was going to record the talk. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I'm just going to start. <laughs> so hi, everyone. My name is Astra, um, and I'm a software engineer at Google on the Google Open Source Security team. Um, and I'm here with my co-presenter, Laurent. Um, I'm also in the same team in the Google Open Source Security team. And today we're going to be talking about authenticating supply chain metadata and how to build remote code attestations on GitHub. So this is going to be a fairly general talk. And I know all day you've been listening to provenance and attestations and that sort of thing all day. So I'll hopefully try to keep it a little bit new. Um, so uh, to go over what I'm going to talk about today, um, first I'm going to just introduce the problem space a little bit with some motivating software supply chain attacks um, as motivating exploits. And then I'll talk a little bit about what general remote code attestations are and the way that we're going to be thinking of them. Um, and then go through two ways that you can achieve them on GitHub reusable workflows and GitHub Actions. Um, and we'll have a demo here, and we'll have some prizes. So make sure you uh, stay awake. <laughs> I might not. <laughs> so, so <laughs> anyway, um, one uh, as you guys have seen probably throughout yesterday and today, if you were at the OpenSSF day, um, is that there are lots and lots of supply chain attacks and compromises that have been going on in the past two years, if not obviously longer, and will probably continue to happen in the coming years. Um, and in one of these cases, there was um, a compromised build infrastructure. Um, this was the Webman 18.0 attack um, that uh, caused a compromised build server to pull source files that were not actually from the source control repository. Um, this actually caused a remote code exploit um, present in their release. Um, so it was actually a pretty high severity bug and lots of news kind of happened as a result. Um, what I kind of want to take away from this is that, you know, had our build server in this particular case done some sort of check on where it was getting those source files from, or if maybe clients who are using that utility had done some kind of check, they may have been able to detect where that source was coming from. Again, uh, lots more attacks here. In this case, uh, not a build infrastructure attack, but a dependency um, attack. And dependencies have such a big attack surface, as you know. And there's lots of different ways that these dependencies can be uh, maliciously injected in different ways. Um, dependency confusion is a really interesting one. Um, this blog post was a pretty cool attack. Um, basically. Uh, lots of big companies are using a mix of both public and private packages um, that are, are hosted on public and private registries. Um, and so this dependency confusion attack exploits that particular you know, mix um, and confuses private ones with public ones. And therefore, you can kind of squat a public name. And you can resolve uh, the package repository tool that you're using will resolve to the public one that you've squatted as a malicious attacker. Um, so again, the takeaway here is uh, a lot of times when you are building something, when you're pulling packages, when you're doing something, you might not have the information that would have been able to tell you what am I actually getting, or what am I using to build, or what am I actually running. Um, so again, more information, the better. Um, another cool one that you will definitely have heard of is the CodeCov attack. Um, and in this one, a malicious attacker used leak credentials to upload a malicious binary to their GCS bucket. And users would often just pull that binary in directly without any sort of verification and run that. And so people were using this in environments that had permissions and tokens exposed. And that was uh, not good. So again, here, um, this one, had there been some kind of proof of where that binary was built before it uploaded to GCS, perhaps people would have been able to detect that. And likewise, if you were a consumer of that binary and you had pulled that in, you might have been able to detect that this is not something that you expected. And likewise, again, because dependency attacks are ubiquitous, um, more. So <laughs> if people have more information, basically the key takeaway here is we need more trustworthy information out there about what's in our software artifacts to help secure um, our pipeline. So what are we using? What are we using to build? Um, what, are, what dependencies are we using to build? What source are we using to build? All these sorts of pieces of information can be better uh, used to verify that later and then make sure we're getting what we expect. So all right, um, what do I mean by a remote code attestation? Um, so I don't like this slide because it's um, a government I don't know, issued statement of what an attestation is, and it's very long. But what they say an attestation is is an issue of a statement based on a decision that fulfillment of specified requirements has been demonstrated. Um, all I mean to say is an attestation is a piece of data representing a proof of an event. Um, so an attestation doesn't necessarily have to be in the world of salsa, which you may have been hearing out about before. 
but it is a general uh, piece of information that can be used to attest to anything you want. And in that kind of event, you might be concerned about what was the environment of that event. So where was it happening? When was it happening? Um, or the materials, like what is being used. Um, recall the uh, Webman exploit where the incorrect source was being used. Um, the recipe, so what steps were used to build, what configuration was used to build, um, and then finally maybe what happened as a result of the event. So what was the output, the subjects, um, and finally the ideal goal here is can you use that uh, you know, attestation or proof piece of data um, to trace that subject back to the materials with the recipe in the environment. Um, so the goal is, you know, can you basically get all the information you need to retrace, refigure out, you know, verify that you're getting exactly what you expected, whether that's you're concerned about the materials you're using or whether you're concerned about the recipe being used. All right, so like I said before, <laughs> we didn't really want to, you know, constantly say, build uh, salsa, 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 salsa. Um, but you can also attest to events like code scanning or code commits or releases or vulner vulnerability disclosures. Um, so you may not always need a salsa provenance. Perhaps you also need an attestation that you performed a vulnerability scan. Um, or perhaps you're a, um, an organization that reviews code and you know, provides some kind of security audit on them. And you want to make a sort of transparent um, attestation that you've reviewed a particular package or a particular piece of software um, and share that with the world for them to use you know, on their policy decisions. Um, so again, they can make code attestations um, and codify you know, what they are actually um, attesting to here. So you can use all these sorts of like, you know, attestations for different things here. All right, so how would they have helped? So in the exploits that we had before, again, like I said before, the, the main idea here is that we'll be able to trace that artifact that you're consuming back to the source code, you know, through that recipe and through the materials in that environment. Um, and this way, you're actually able to ensure that, you know, you're getting the expected source. Um, you are not getting any backdoors inserted. Maybe your dependency list is something that you've curated and you expect. Um, and you know, kind of protect yourself from the sort of supply chain attacks that we saw before. Um, and also, like I said, if you're not looking at um, code attestations specifically related to builds and to you know, things like Salsa, you may be able to say, okay, I have some extra assurance that you know, XYZ party did a security audit of this particular package. Um, so in a world, maybe in five years, maybe we build up a you know, common language of these attestations, which we do have, and we'll kind of grow the technology and tools for people to share these attestations with the world um, and make policies and decisions based on those. All right, so now I get into the big crux of the problem here, which is trust. Um, so step one, it's great to have availability of data, but step two, it's probably great to also trust that data. Um, and how can one trust an attestation? Um, so what exactly do I mean by trust? Um, maybe, you know, maybe you're considering, do I trust the producer of the attestation? Um, do I trust you know, the organization that might have created that attestation um, and you know, generated it? Or do I trust the process generating the attestation? Um, second, this is a bit of like a nuanced one, which I think is a little bit trickier to solve. Um, do I trust the attestation was not interfered with when it was produced? Um, and so this is a particular point that I will try to hopefully um, drive in later in this talk and sort of describe what I mean by interference. Um, but you may not only want to, let's say, create an attestation of something. You may want proof that that attestation was created in an environment where something might not have interfered with it. And that something could be the build itself, or that something could be the owner of the package. Um, and especially when uh, you might consider people who are creating self-attestations or creating attestations on something that they are doing, how can they actually you know, provide you with some trust or guarantee that they didn't you know, meddle with it for their own benefits? Uh, maybe they don't want to get alerts, or maybe they don't want to get people to send a letter to them saying that they didn't properly do something. Um, and then last, do I trust that the attestation was not altered? Um, this one should probably be a little bit easier to think of. Sometimes um, whenever you think of altering or tampering data, um, generally maybe someone thinks of digital signatures. Um, so definitely that will be a part of my talk.
All right, so now that we have what I mean by trust out of the way, now I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about um, how can we actually do this in practice. Um, so what I really like is uh, GitHub released a feature, I think sometime in like October or late Q3, Q4 of last year, um, called reusable workflows. Um, and we've been playing around with them a lot and messing around with them a lot and found a bunch of really cool features about them that we want to exploit. So um, anyway, obviously, probably most of you are familiar with GitHub workflows already. Um, they're a pretty standard way of running CI um, builds, actions, tools, um, and so on in you know natively in GitHub. And many times, people actually just run releases on GitHub as well. Um, so these are all defined in your source repository um, under you know a particular folder, and you can use these um, to run you know third-party actions. You can use these to run your own commands. You can use these to I don't know maybe create attestations. Um, and they can also uh, be triggered on different events, and those events can you know, be manually triggered or they can be triggered on some sort of like you know, pushing a tag. Um, anyway, they're awesome. I'm sure you all have seen them before. Um, they look something like this. They're defined in YAML, and they, again, have a particular trigger involved, and then they can be used, again, to run some sort of arbitrary code in there. So they're built with a, a sequence of jobs, and each of those jobs consists of se a sequence of steps. Um, and so inside those steps, you can run whatever code you want. Um, and so for you know, the duration of this, let's just think of, uh, you know, I want to create an attestation of that thing that I ran. I guess it cuts off for everyone. Yeah, sorry about that. I, there's probably no information over there that's really that <laughs> relevant. Um, but right, so how do we create a verifiable attestation about what was run in that GitHub workflow? So again, if you're thinking maybe I want to run a, you know, a code scan in your GitHub workflow, or maybe I want to run a build and then perform a release on a GitHub workflow, can I actually create an attestation that I performed that in that workflow? And can I, pro can I prove it to other people? Um, so for the sake of this, I'm going to say, let's create an attestation on this particular event. Um, all right, so a naive attempt would be, let's perform the event that we want to attest to, and then let's just record it. Um, let's say, you know, maybe I can pull some logs, or maybe I can just you know, check out the repository at the particular commit that the workflow is in and say, yes, uh, I actually performed echo hello world here. Um, that might be a naive way of doing this, and it might be sufficient for some people, especially maybe if you trust what's going on in my event and you trust what's going on in that particular repository, but it might not be enough. Um, for example, my event might interfere with record my event. Um, we might see uh, other, uh, like perhaps also, there's an incentive for the maintainer of this repository to record a slightly different version of Hello World here. And that particular um, owner would be able to manipulate the generated attestation to however they want. Maybe they do something weird. Maybe they don't check out the repository. They just do whatever they want. So it's not quite an isolated, provable process here to say, OK, I'm just going to generate the attestation by myself in the same workflow. And I control how I'm generating the attestation. And so you get what you get kind of thing. You kind of want some extra assurances around, OK, I didn't tamper with this. Um, all right, so like I said before, a bunch of problems here. Um, the first one around interference. Can any of the other steps or jobs in that workflow actually interfere with the recording of that in order to produce false info? Um, and they might build processes. There's lots of weird things that might happen. There's um, hooks that you might run. There's all sorts of weird things that might happen. And also, you as a maintainer might interfere with the generation of that attestation itself. Um, and the second and the third, integrity and authenticity, um, those one kind of go hand in hand. Integrity, you might not trust that, let's say, you know, that GitHub workflow uploads that recorded attestation after the fact. Um, can I go in and just replace it with something else? I mean, maybe, right? So can I tamper-proof that? Can I make sure that it's not being altered after I produce that attestation? And then the authenticity portion of this, can I actually prove that ownership? So they kind of go hand in hand. Can I prove that you know, it wasn't tampered with and the original author was something in the workflow? Um, so these are the three types of problems that I'm going to be dealing with and trying to say, OK, yes, we have a solution. All right, so my solution here is GitHub reusable workflows, like I introduced before. Um, so what I want to show you is GitHub reusable workflows. They are basically like a GitHub action, um, but they are a reference to a workflow hosted in someone else's repository. So the owner of this user slash repo doesn't actually have access to modify trusted builder and can call into it like a separate workflow. 
And with this sort of like isolation step, um, user slash repo can actually call into something that they you know, don't control. Um, and let's say that that trusted um, event over here performs that exact event that we want to attest to and then generates the added station away from the user repository. So with this, your user repository doesn't really have a way of tampering with what's going on in both the event and the generation of the attestation. So what I like about this is that you have that isolation for free. And what's kind of different about this versus GitHub Actions, which is probably going to be a question, is that there is uh, kind of by default um, no permeance of environment variables or defaults and things like that into a GitHub reusable workflow. So there isn't really a point of like, okay, I'm a maintainer who has you know, influence over user repo. Can I go and manipulate the generated attestation in the trusted event builder? Um, and Laurent will kind of talk about what steps can be done to, well, can kind of show you the pain process around um, you know, what GitHub Actions uh, doesn't do by default, where GitHub reusable workflows will. So again, this isolation piece, um, we get a nice layer of isolation between the user repository and the repository that's actually performing whatever event you want to attest to. Um, so again, let's generate the attestation here. Um, so interference, let's take care of that. Um, now the second two problems, integrity and authenticity, let's tackle those together. Um, and I'll use everyone's favorite word here, <laughs> is um, SigStore. So um, what we'll do is create signatures with authenticity. So create signatures with a form of like identity component based inside the signature um, metadata, I guess. So in this case, what we're doing is we're using workload identity here, which is sim similar to Spiffy, which you may have heard um, the talk previous on Tecton Chains a little bit about. So what we didn't do is use OpenID Connect, um, which is supported inside GitHub workflows, to create a signed um, certificate from a certificate authority on that identity. So our signing certificate will contain the identity of the trusted builder, so the trusted event, you know, performer of the event and attestation. Um, that way we have an ownership um, or authorship over you know, who created that attestation because that particular signing cert must have been created inside that environment. So that certificate that signs that attestation or provenance is going to be located, you know, uh, or it can be located to that identity of that trusted workflow. Um, so as an example, the return signing certificate from something using OpenID Connect with um, Sigstore's keyless signing would have a subject alternative name with the fully qualified location of the reusable workflow. So this makes it really nice because you have an identification of like what actually performed that you know, event and what actually recorded that provenance. Um, but you also, in addition, get a lot of information that is maybe useful to you. For example, um, what triggered the event, the push did, that's the 1.2 extension. Um, or what was the caller repository, so that user repository that actually invoked the trusted reusable workflow. And that's the 1.5 extension, um, my own repository. Um, and you'll also get some other information about which particular workflow invoked that. So with this signing cert, if you use this to sign the actual provenance inside that environment, then you have that authorship, um, so that identity component. Um, of who created that attestation, and you also get a sort of bind to that data in, in a way that makes it you know, tamper-proof. Um, so you know, if anyone decides to alter that provenance outside of that workflow, it would not be signed by this particular identity anymore, and so you would fail verification. Um, so, all right, yeah, putting it all together, um, this is kind of the layout of how you can create these attestations. If you create as like perhaps a organization, a collection of reusable workflows, or use some that are distributed by Salsa, um, the Salsa framework organization, which is us, um, then what you can do is you can invoke those and create attestations that you definitely can prove that you did not tamper with and you did not you know, interfere with the creation of. So roughly all of these are going to have the same structure of perform the event, and then in a separate job, which is an isolated VM, record the event. Um, and this way, when you get back that information into your call ling workflow, you'll have a you know, statement of uh, proof that that was created inside this trusted workflow and also with that guarantee of integrity. So now we have all three. We have interference, integrity, and you can't see the check mark, but I can, and we also have authenticity. 
Um, so, all right, that's basically our like rough setup. That's the whole like you know this can be used for really anything. Um, and so verifying an attestation, we're kind of going to rewind on those steps that I just talked about. We're first going to try to get that integrity component by verifying the signature on the attestation, verify that prover identity, so verify the identity of the trusted reusable workflow. That's going to give us authenticity and isolation. And so now you have trust over the actual attestation or that proof. So now you can go run with it, do what you want. Um, go check the source, go check the materials, go check the environment, um, go check the actual statement. All right, so now I'm going to hand it off to Laurent, who's going to talk about applications of this um, and also do our demo. Right, thanks. Uh, yeah, so my turn to speak. I'm going to try to do as well as Usra. The bar is pretty high, so let's go. Um, <laughs> you fixed so, that. <laughs> so the, uh, yes, so as you might imagine, the, the most compelling application of reusable workflow and trusted builders is artifact attestation, also known as salsa provenance. And here by artifact, I mean anything which is the output of a build pipeline. It could be a binary, it could be a package, NPM package. It could also be something else like an SBOM, because an SBOM is also something that's the output of a build. And you might want to prove to a third party that the SBOM is authentic, right? And how you created it is, might be important for a consumer. So I'm, I'm going to repeat a little bit what Astra said and what you heard about Salsa. But essentially, with the attestation, we can create a strong link between the artifact and the uh, source, the uh, original sources, which you, know, you think the, the binary or the artifact is coming from. In particular, we can actually tell you which repository, uh, which, which source, which repository the source came from, at which hash commit it, it was uh, built. And we can also uh, report all the, all the steps that were performed during the, the compilation or the build. So say if you want all your builds to have a special flag when they're being compiled, maybe you want something like CFI with the latest ARM, you know, pointer integrity support, then you can trust, you, you can use uh, artifact provenance to check for this before you deploy uh, the binary into production. So um, I want to give you uh, some of the use cases that we think are really interesting and that are enabled by having artifact uh, attestation. So the first use case I'd like to take is the GitHub dependency API graph. GitHub have an API where you give it two commits, two different char, and it gives you in response the list of dependencies that have been uh, changed during those two commits. So here in, on the slide, you see that there's one NPM package that has been added, and its name is Helmet, all right? And the API also returns the source repository that was uh, used to create this package. The source repository, unfortunately, is not authenticated. It's taken from the manifest file. So we, we don't really have a strong binding between you know, the package and the original uh, source code that was used to create it. With artifact attestation, we can fill this gap and create this strong binding. So once we have all those attestation, we can start creating policies. And you might be able to enforce policies at different time uh, in your you know, in your supply chain, you could have it, for example, before uh, in the control plane. So you want to deploy a, a cluster. You would be able to check that your container uh, is coming from, from the right source repository, for example. You might also want to, in, to uh, enforce policies at build time instead of doing it at, at the last minute. So let's say you're creating a builder, uh, sorry, a container image. You could have a policy that, that says, fail unless the base image is coming from, say, distroless build from this, re this repository, for example. And then you could also have policies at installation time when you run npm install or pip install or apt get install and all this sort of stuff. Another interesting use case is yet another GitHub dependency API. So I think two days ago, um, GitHub released this new API 
for maintainers. So uh, the, the motivation behind this new API is that for certain ecosystems, it's pretty difficult to pass the dependencies statically. And in some cases, maybe you can't actually resolve the dependencies until you have built you know, the final artifact. So they, create, they created this API where maintainers can build and then publish their exact dependencies. And thereafter, GitHub can give you, you know, custom alerts and more accurate alerts about you know, the sort of vulnerabilities that have been found in those dependencies. You can think about it basically as an SBOM sort of API where maintainers push their SBOM to GitHub. Now, in the context of the supply chain, me as a maintainer, I might want to prove to someone else who's consuming my artifact that my SBOM was generated without cheating and I'm not hiding vulnerabilities because I have some dependencies uh, that might have vulnerabilities. So using artifact attestation or cell cell provenance, you can prove to a third party that your SBOM is authentic and you can prove to them how you created it. And as Asra uh, mentioned throughout the talk, you can really use those kind of attestation for any kind of metadata. Maybe you're running a static analysis tool and you want to report the results. CodeCov could do something like this, for example, to report. If you want to prove to a third party that you have, say, 30% coverage, coverage on your unit test, you would be able to do this with a reusable workflow. All right. So as Asra said, we've been playing around with those reusable workflows for a few months. And uh, today, we are actually releasing a uh, builder workflow for the Go programming language, which uh, is a V1 version. It's ready today. You can use it. Uh, we have everything uh, working. We have a verifier where you can, you can run it and verify that uh, you can re verify the attestation. So this is ready to use uh, today, and I'm going to give you a demo. Um, yeah, just right now. The builder is Salsa 3 compliant, meaning that the provenance information is non-forgeable using all the techniques that Astra described uh, earlier in the talk. All right, so some demo time. Oops. Okay, so as an example, I'm going to take the scorecard project, which is another uh, project for, from the OpenSSF. And I'm going to show you how to basically use the builder. So as you can see, the version 4.4.0 of Scorecard uh, already has you know, the binary and its corresponding attestation or salsa provenance that you can download uh, from the website and verify. So first, let me show you how you can use the builder that we have written for Go. It's really simple. It just takes two steps. The first is you create a config file explaining the, the sort of, like all the flags and the arguments that you want us to pass to the compiler. So it's pretty simple. And then second, you define a workflow. Right here. So here we're just calling the uh, trusted builder uh, built from a reusable workflow at line 32. And that's really all, all it takes to start building uh, and generate salsa provenance, which is non-forgeable using uh, GitHub Actions. Now let me show you uh, how we can verify this provenance. I have already downloaded the... I've already downloaded the uh, binary and the provenance. So all it takes is to use a project that we have on GitHub. It's called the Salsa Verifier. Uh, we plan to have it available you know, as uh, Linux packages and make it easier for people to install. But for now, you have to, to just install it you know, by downloading the binary or using go install uh, to get it on your machine. So it's pretty simple. It takes uh, a path to the binary, a path to the provenance, and then you give it the source repository you believe this file, this binary is coming from. And then we have optional uh, par uh, arguments such as the tag. 
as you saw earlier, this was the V4.4.0 version. So here it's, it's succeeding. If I was trying to maybe perform a rollback attack and give you a binary that was from a previous version, then it would fail. And similarly, if you give it a different repository, it fails, all right? So this is great. Now let's uh, take a look at, sorry. Let's take a look at the content of this, the provenance. So there's lots of stuff, so I'm just gonna focus on, you know, the sort of things that might be interesting. Uh, so obviously we have the hash commit that was used to compile this binary and the repository, OpenSSF scorecard. Then here we have the steps. So as you can see here, we have a first step where we ran mod, uh, go mod vendor. And then the second step is this long command, blah, 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 and the list of environment variable that were used to compile this binary. And using this, you can just rebuild and just replay that. And it, maybe if you use the same Go compiler, you'll get the same result. Although I'm not sure that's entirely true, but you know, that's, that's a different question. Uh, all right, other kind of information we see that is interesting might be here, the GitHub actor. That's basically the person who triggered the build. In this case, it was me. And the event name. So that was basically a build that was triggered on GitHub uh, with a push event, all right? So let's go back to the presentation. Right, oops, that doesn't work very well. But. All right, and we have more, uh, we have more information. Uh, how many, five? Uh, yeah, so I highly encourage you to uh, try out those builders and let us know on, on GitHub. I also want to mention that the OpenSSF reward uh, program uh, rewards pro uh, developers who will install, you know, this kind of trusted builders, uh, which improve the supply chain of critical repositories. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to go through this, um, but um, there's actually a an interesting question that we asked ourselves a couple of months ago, and can we actually build remote code attestation without a reusable workflow, just, just using a GitHub action? So remember what Asra said, if you just use GitHub action, you don't have isolation, so the maintainer can really meddle with everything that's happening in the build. And it, does, it turns out that we can, so I'm gonna skip over because we don't have time. Basically, the, the problem statement is the following. We have, say, I call it the scorecard GitHub action, because that's something that we use in the, in the scorecard action. So we have a, a scorecard action, and we want to prove to a scorecard server that the results are genuine and haven't been tampered with by the, by the maintainer. So what we do to solve this problem is, again, we reuse, the, uh, we, we reuse six store and the OIDC token. What we do is we get a certificate from six store which indicates the repository name, the hash commit, and the workflow that's currently running. And then we sign the results of scorecard with this certificate. Server side, after verifying the signature, we fork that repository at this, at this, this exact hash that is present in the certificate. That gives us the exact copy of the workflow that is being run. And then what we do is we inspect the source code of the workflow. And, but what I mean by inspecting is we kind of validate that this workflow, the source code of the workflow is just calling scorecard and hasn't added any additional steps to try to tamper with the results. So we're gonna look for things like, is it uh, you know, running on GitHub hosted runners or self-hosted runners? We're gonna look at whether there's additional scripts that are run or maybe additional uh, jobs that are declared and run, or you know, spe specific services are started or containers are used. We're gonna check all this, and if, if everything 
uh, checks out and we trust the source code, then we know that what's being run and run by GitHub is actually the uh, scorecard action and therefore we can trust the results that we are receiving from the, on the server side. So to conclude, we can achieve remote code attestation on GitHub with reusable workflow, but also with GitHub Actions. Uh, however, I, I wouldn't recommend using GitHub Action because it's pretty tricky to get right. You know, you have to pass the workflow. You have to be sure you're not forgetting anything when you validate it. You also have this additional round trip where you have to, to fork the, the workflow file from GitHub to verify it. So uh, all in all, I, I don't encourage you to use GitHub Action for remote code attestation, and I highly encourage you to use reusable workflows. They're really simple to use, and they give you isolation for free. Um, so yeah. So I'd like to reiterate that, yeah, today we've just launched the uh, general availability of our trusted builders for Go projects. Uh, I encourage you to take a look, give it a try, give us some feedback. Astra also created a special repository for you uh, to try out uh, you know, how to verify provenance, get used to its content, learn how you can use it in your, in your own projects. So give it a try and let us know if this, if this is helpful. And that's the end of our talk. Thank you very much. Any questions? Santiago. <laughs> so, uh, this is super cool. Uh, I was wondering how does uh, I6 and Encoder World could fit into this picture? Like, how this application makes just naturally fit into the Encoder library? And I wonder if there's a, something to do with stuff there? That's a, that's a good question. So, right now we're using the Intoto attestation format for Salsa Provenance as well. But, on terms of you know, what can we do to sort of generically support more of these, um, maybe it would be an interesting thing to create like, you know, helper actions that can be invoked inside reusable workflows to help create some of those attestations in that format. Um, so, that's, that's something that we, we were thinking about anyway for um, sort of scaling up our builders um, and sort of modularizing the components there. Um, and perhaps creating some like tooling around um, GitHub actions that you can invoke there for creating attestations would be really cool. That's a great idea. Yeah. Also, so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, Brandon also is, has worked on a salsa attestation for s -bombs. So he has a special predicate, and I think he has a proof of concept. So we can easily use it for s -bomb. And in fact, our, our builder in the next I think the next version we want to support S bomb generation with you know an attestation attached to it. Go find the Easter egg, we'll give you some swag. Oh yeah, we have shirts. <laughs> All right. If no further question, thank you again. <laughs>